Lord, we come before you this morning, and Lord, we thank you that you were willing to become flesh and dwell among us, to be that sacrifice for us. And so we celebrate this time of year, Lord, and we just thank you for the work that you've done for us, that we can be forever with you. We pray, Lord, for our worship this morning. We want to honor you through these songs. And Lord, just prepare our hearts to receive the message you have for each of us. We thank you, Lord, and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. We're going to be reading this morning from Psalm 119, starting at verse 65. 65. Thou hast dwelt, thou hast dwelt well with thy servant, O Lord, according unto thy word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed thy commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Thou art good and doest good. Teach me thy statutes. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in thy law. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. They that fear thee will be glad when they see me, because I have hoped in thy word. I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right, and that thou hast in faithfulness has afflicted me. Let, I pray thee, my, thy merciful kindness be my comfort, according to thy word unto thy servant. Let thy tender mercies come unto me, that I may live. For thy law is my delight. Let the proud be ashamed, for they dealt perversely with me without a cause. But I will meditate in thy precepts. Let those that fear thee turn unto me, and those that have known thy testimonies. Let my heart be sound in thy statutes, that I be not ashamed. This morning, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2 as we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're going to be looking at this topic, peace on earth. And it's kind of, to me, it's an interesting topic because are we seeing peace on earth? It's not even close, right? Even in America, we see Americans more divided than ever before. We see things going on in the Ukraine, and we're not getting the story. You know, one of our missionaries, um, Pastor Ben, is in the Ukraine, and he's telling us they're, they're in darkness a lot of the time because Russia is attacking their power plants. And so it's winter there, no power. It's tough. And so keep them in prayer. The world is a, a very dangerous place. And here's the other thing. You know, when the holiday season comes around, especially, especially Christmas, Depression tends to increase in people's lives. In fact, according to the American Psychological Association, 38% of people surveyed said their stress increased during the holiday season. And that's interesting. You know, it's supposed to be a time of rejoicing, right, and family, but we get so overwhelmed with these things and we have a lot of stress. And, you know, I think as you look at life in general, especially the last few years, the things we face day to, in and day out can cause us to lose hope, to be depressed. Well, I'll just share some statistics with you. As we're told depression among adults in the United States tripled in the early 2020 months of the global coronavirus pandemic, jumping from 8.5% before the pandemic to stagger, staggering 27.8%. New research from Boston University School of Public Health reveals that elevated rate of depression has persisted into 2021 and even worse in climbing to 32.8% and affecting one in every three American adults. And those numbers haven't really gone down, which is interesting. 
Americans are very, very depressed. And people are worrying. 84% of Americans say they are either extremely or very worried, compared to 42% of Americans who describe themselves as extremely or very hopeful. Wow, you know, they've lost hope. Those are not very good statistics, are they? I know you're thinking, it's Christmas, Joe, come on, what are you doing? I'm depressed now. Hang in there, right? Because what Luke is going to show us is that there is great hope. Not in the government, not in our health, not in jobs or relationships, not in this or that. There's great hope in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and we need to keep our eyes on him because we can have peace and hope right now. You know, the Christmas song, Joy to the World, the President has come. Oh no, the Lord has come. There's where our hope is. But we get so overwhelmed with all these things. And even this, like I said, this season, you know, all the gifts I have to buy and this and that. Am I going to get done in time? And hey, joy to the world, the Lord has come. I've broken these verses that we're going to be looking at this morning into the following points, and they're in your bulletin. The Savior is born in Luke 2, verses 1 through 7. Shepherds fear, Luke 2, 8 and 9. Good Tidings, Luke 2, verses 10 through 12, and Peace on Earth, Luke 2, 13 through 14. So let's pick up Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, and let's see what the Lord has for us this morning as we study this topic, Peace on Earth. We're told, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid them in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. This is exactly what mankind needed. It's not what they were looking for, but it truly was what they needed, the Savior is born. In fact, ever since sin entered this world back in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam sinned, that sin nature has been passed down from generation to generation to generation. Every person that was born. And that's the problem. But here's the amazing thing, and it just blows me away. Even before there was the problem of sin, even before man was created, God knew what he needed to do to rescue man, to save his creation. He was the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world, before they were ever created. He knew that he was going to have to be a sacrifice for man's sin. So God became flesh, he dwelt among us, to pay in full the penalty for our sins. In fact, Paul in Galatians 4, verses 4 through 5, put it like this. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. You see, it was the perfect timing that this came forth, that God became flesh and dwelt among us. Everything else before that was the preparation for the coming Messiah, for Jesus. Now, one of the things today that people tend to believe is that the Bible is just a bunch of stories. You know, once upon a time. Let me ask you this. In any of your Bibles, do you ever see once upon a time written? No. Then why do people believe it? Because they don't want to believe what the Bible has to say. Now, here's the thing. When you look at the historical documents, Quirinius was governor over Syria in 7 to 9 AD. That would place the birth of Christ several years too late. And so Bible critics love to say, oh, Bible error. It can't be from God. Look at this. Well, first of all, the word first in verse 2 is the Greek word pro, and it can be read like this. The census took place before Quirinius was governor over Syria, and that would make sense. 
Many believe that he was governor over Syria twice in 3 to 3 to 2 BC. Um, and if that was the census or taxation when it took place, it would place this around 4 BC. That's the time frame of Jesus, if you think about it. He wasn't born on the zero date, right? He was born before that. Caesar Augustus, Octavius, he's also called. He ruled Rome from 27 BC to 14 AD. He's the one that makes this decree that a census be taken. And he was the first Caesar to be called Augustus. And prior to that, this was a title given to the gods. But now man had become God, at least in their minds. In fact, when Caesar Augustus died, men actually comforted themselves reflecting that Augustus was a god and that gods do not die. Yeah, he's dead and he's still dead, okay? But these men thought they were gods. They thought they were in power, in control, and they did whatever they want. Does it sound like our leaders today? It absolutely does. They think they're in charge. They think they're doing what they want. And you know what? They are doing the plan of God. This is what God has already said is going to take place. They think they're so smart, but in the end, they're not. And what does Augustus want to do? He wants to tax the people. And the world that was around during this period of time, this world that Jesus was born into, not very good. In fact, one writer put it like this. The lusty peninsula was worn out with the 20 years of civil war. Its farms had been neglected. Its towns had been sacked or besieged. Much of its wealth had been stolen or destroyed. Administration and protection had broken down. Robbers made every street unsafe at night. Highwaymen roamed the roads, kidnapped travelers, and sold them into slavery. Trade diminished. Investment stood still. And interest rates soared. Property values fell. Morals, which had been loosed, loosened by riches and luxury, had not been improved by destitution and chaos. For few conditions are more demoralizing than poverty that comes after wealth. Rome was full of men who had lost their economic footing and then their moral stability. Soldiers who had tasted adventure and had learned to kill. Citizens who had seen their savings consumed in the taxes and inflation of war and waited uh, for some returning tide to life them back to affluence. Women dizzy and with freedom, multiplying divorces, abortions, and adulteries. It sounds like a newscast from today, doesn't it? We're not much different than what Rome was like during this period of time. And there was not a lot of hope. So here's this decree that goes forth from Augustus, and people had to return to their home city to register and pay their taxes. So Mary and Joseph make this 80-mile journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Bethlehem means house of bread. And make no mistake about it, this was not an easy journey. I don't know how, long, how far along Mary was in her pregnancy, but for Joseph, there was no way he was going to leave her home. Why? Because the talk of the town was Mary's pregnant and not by Joseph, and they're not, they haven't been married yet even. And so he wasn't going to leave her in that situation, so he took her with him. And you think, but why? I mean, why in the world would God do something like this? Mary's pregnant. I mean, you know, when my wife was in the latter stages of pregnancy, she didn't even want to go in the car. Here you're on a donkey probably, right? Four-wheel drive, yes, but still a donkey. And you're pregnant, and you're going 80 miles. Wow. What was happening here was fulfilling the plans and purposes of God. This wasn't some random act by Caesar Augustus. This was foreordained ordained by God. And God used Augustus to fulfill his plans. Micah 5.2, But you, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, Yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth are from of old, from everlasting. Bethlehem Ephratah, the one by Judah. There was another Bethlehem 
God is very specific here. Not like Nostradamus, you know, oh, the sky's going to turn gray and the trees are going to bloom and there's going to be flowers. Well, yeah, what, what does that mean? And everyone's got their interpretations, right? This is very specific. specific. The Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem of Ephrata in Judea. And this is not a normal child. How do I know? Well, because his goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. It means from beyond the vanishing point. What Micah is telling us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is that this child that is going to be born in Bethlehem, Ephrata, is going to be Almighty God because only God is everlasting. He's eternal. This is from beyond the vanishing point. God is becoming flesh and dwelling amongst us. This is 700 years or so before this event took place. God told us where the Messiah was to be born. And again, I'm sure Augustus thought he was in control. I'm going to get the money. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm, I'm a God. But God's in control. Proverbs 21.1, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord like the rivers of water. He turns it wherever he wishes. Yeah. So here they are. They travel this 80-mile journey to Bethlehem. And Mary goes into labor. And her son is born. They call him Jesus. And the way Luke writes this, and remember, Luke was a physician, it seems like Mary was alone. There was no one to help in the delivery except for Joseph being there. And they wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Just torn strips of cloth. That's what the word means. So we see here, the Savior is born, the Savior of the world. And then we're going to talk about shepherd's fear. And you'll see why in a minute. Look at verse 8 here in Luke chapter 2. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. So the first group of people who heard about the birth of the Savior were shepherds. Now those are not the first group of people you would think. These were not the priests, they were not businessmen, they were not the high-class society type people, not the highly educated people. Shepherds were the outcasts of society. In fact, they were known for their dishonesty. You couldn't trust them. Morris tells us, as a class, shepherds had a bad reputation. More regrettable was their habit of confusing mine with thine as they moved about the country. They were considered unreliable and were not allowed to give testimony in the law courts. I think that's interesting. You know, they travel around, right? They're shepherds. They keep taking things. Wow. It's not like little kids, right? Why in the world of all the people, these are probably the least ones you want to talk to because they're the ones that needed a savior and they knew it. They knew they were not good. And so God comes forth to those who are in need and shares with them this, going to share with them this wonderful news. They're in the area of Bethlehem. Keep that in mind. That's where they take care of the temple flock, the sheep. They cared for the lambs that were used in the temple sacrifices. But who was, gonna, who was born there? The Lamb of God, Jesus, was born in Bethlehem where these sheep were that were used in sacrifice were being kept as well. But here, no more sacrifices will be needed because the perfect sacrifice was going to be made by Jesus. So here they are. It's nighttime. They're out in the fields, right, with their sheep watching over them. An angel appears to them, and what do they do? They were greatly afraid. No kidding. I mean, think about it. You know, I hear a noise at night. I'm wondering what in the world's going on. You know, we don't have a dog anymore. Julie goes to the retreat, and I'm hearing all kinds of noises. I'm like, man, now's the time to have a gun. I don't have one. I'll just run really fast. 
But then I, these guys see this angel, this great light shining around them, and they're terrified. Yeah. What about us? You know, we're kind of living in this world that is crazy. Maybe you're fearful, afraid of what's going on. Maybe you lost hope. Here's the thing, guys. Don't give up. Don't give in. You bring it to the Lord. And it sounds so simple and nice, but the things you're going through are not that simple. They're not that nice. And think about this world that Jesus came into. Why? Because man was living in darkness and the light of the world stepped into this darkness, pierced this darkness, and shined brightly. And that's the key for us. If we're walking in darkness now, if things seem dark and scary, come to the light of Jesus. These shepherds, yeah, they were in fear. They were afraid as this angel appeared to them in the field. And what's this angel going to do? He's going to bring good tidings. It's going to change the way they feel. Look at verse 10 here in Luke 2. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger, Wow. Who was this angel? It could be Gabriel. Gabriel seems to bring the angel that brings news, uh, information to God's people. And this time he's bringing good tidings. Really, the gospel message. The Savior of the world is born. And it wasn't just for the Jews. It was to all people. It's amazing. You know, what do people want today? What did they want back then? Well, maybe they wanted an advisor. What are we going to do? No, they needed a Savior. Maybe a doctor. Maybe their health's not good. No, you really need the Savior. Businessman? No. Savior. Lawyer? No. Savior. Warrior? No, we need a Savior because our sins have separated us from God. And that's the problem, sin. But how many people want to deal with that today? Especially in our society and even in many churches today, we don't want to talk about sin because it's a bad word. It is a bad word. It's a horrible word. Sin separates us from a holy God. And here's the thing. Sin's the problem. And people will not find peace in their lives or in this world until the sin issue is dealt with. And we'll deal with that in a minute. Now, the shepherds are also told that the Savior is to be found wrapped in swaddling cloths and in a manger or feeding trough. Now, think about this. The Savior of the world, is that the place you would expect him? Is that the way you would expect him to be dressed? Absolutely not. You expect, expect him to be born in a castle, a mansion, maybe in a purple outfit with a little crown on his head, right? Right? That's what you expect the Savior of the world to be like. No, he's born in Bethlehem in this little feeding trough. And he's wrapped in just pieces of cloth. That's our Lord. And the word Christ is not his last name. It means Messiah. That's who he is. And they're going to find this Savior, the Savior of mankind, lying in a manger. Now, for these shepherds, for the people, this great joy they might be looking for is probably not the Savior to be born, but they're looking for what? Peace and safety and comfort and wealth and this and that. In fact, for the Jews at this time, they were under persecution, Roman rule. And there was peace as long as you did what Rome told you to do. But you crossed that line and look out. They were not very nice. And all I could say is, man, thank God we don't have to worry about wars and conflicts today, right? Well, a little sarcastic. Not even a little sarcastic. That was really sarcastic. 
there are wars and rumors of wars all over the place. That's threats of violence, right? Not a lot of joy. People are fearful. And what do people think about war? Well, there's an article that was written recently from, in Scientific American, April of 2022, Will War Ever End? And it just caught my attention. I had to read it, you know. I thought that was interesting. But this is what it said. I recently asked my first year, year humanities classes, will war ever end? I specified that I had in mind the end of all wars, like the one currently uh, ravaging Ukraine and even the threat of war between nations. I primed my students by assigning warf Warfare is Only an Invention by anthropologist Margaret Mead and A History of Violence by psychologist uh, Steven Pinker. Some students suspect, like Pinker, that war seems from deep-rooted evolutionary impulses. Others agree with me that war is, in her own words, a bad invention rather than a biological necessity or sociological inevitability. But whether they see war as springing primarily from nature or nurture, almost all my students answer, no, war will never end. War is inevitable, my students say, because humans are innately greedy and belligerent or because materialism, like capitalism, has become a permanent part of our culture, or because even if most of us hate war, warmongers like Hitler and Putin will always arise, forcing the people being attacked to fight in self-defense. My students' reactions didn't, don't surprise me. I started asking if war will ever end almost 20 years ago during the U.S. invasion of Iraq. Since then, I've polled thousands of people of all ages and political persuasions in the U.S. and elsewhere, and nine out of ten people say war is inevitable. This fatalism is understandable. The U.S. has been at war nonstop since 9-11. Although American troops left Afghanistan last year after 20 years of violent occupation, the U.S. still maintains a global military empire span spanning 80 countries and territories. Russia's invasion of the Ukraine reinforces our sense that when our war ends, another begins. War fatalism pervades our culture. In The Expanse, a sci-fi series I'm reading, a character describes war as madness that's in our nature. It flares up and it subsides, but never vanishes for good. I'm afraid that as long as we're, we're human, he says, war will be with us. Ending war won't be easy but it should be a moral imperative, as much so as ending slavery and the subjugation of women. The first step toward ending war is believing it is possible. You know, I find it interesting. His solution is the first step to ending war is believing it is possible. <clears throat> In September of this year, I believed the Chicago Bears were going to win their division. Believing did not help, did it? Just because you believe something doesn't mean it's going to happen. What is that belief based in? And for him, nothing, right? I think the character in The Expanse had it right. Madness, that's in our nature. It's called the sin nature. That's the problem. Yeah, I don't know if you remember this. Some of you are too young. But back in the late 60s, early 70s, you know, the hippie movement, what was their big slogan? Make love, not war. How did that work out? Well, if you really look at what happened within those, that culture, they fought amongst each other. They didn't get along. They were at war with each other. They, they wanted to make love, not war, but the exact opposite happened. Why? Because of the heart. You see, there's the problem. We want to stop all these problems. And we think if we get the right leaders in office or we have this global government, we'll be able to stop war. Are you kidding me? Well, there is one global government that will. It's called the government of Jesus Christ when he comes back. But we'll, again, we'll deal with that in a minute. It's that sin nature, though, that's the problem. And there will be no peace in this world until we first make peace with God. And there's the problem. We don't, people don't want to make peace with God. They just want peace in this world. And it doesn't happen like that. 
When man makes peace with God, then and only then can there be peace with their fellow man and peace on earth. Why did Jesus come the first time? Why was he born to die and go to the cross of Calvary for our sin, right? Sin separated man from God. That's what we're told in Isaiah 59. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is his ear heavy that he cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. There's the problem. Sin separates. And how is that sin manifested in the lives of mankind? Well, again, in Isaiah 59, as Isaiah continues on in verses 3 through 8, he tells us, and it's not a pretty picture, for your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue has muttered perversity. No one calls for justice, nor does any plead for truth. They trust in empty words and speak lies. They conceive evil and bring forth iniquity. They hatch vipers' eggs and weave the spider's web. He who eats of their eggs dies, and from that which is crushed a viper breaks out. Their webs will not become garments, nor will they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they have not known, and there is no justice in their ways. They have made themselves crooked paths. Whoever takes that way shall not know peace. Now, it's not a pretty picture, nor is it intended to be. It's a reality. Man apart from God, lost in his sins, he walks in darkness and not the light of God. And so this is what's manifested in their lives, this evil, this darkness. It's what we see going on today. Look at what they were approving of. They approved of violence, of murder. They had their reasons. Their hands, they were doing evil towards people, justifying themselves. Not just physical violence, but the words they spoke were lies, destroyed people's lives. Their words that flowed from their lips were evil and perverse. And they're not calling for justice. Why? Because they like the lifestyle that they're living. They enjoy living in the sin. They're not interested in the truth. Why? Because they're comfortable with the lies. Don't we see that today? I was just talking with someone today. Isn't it interesting how we call good evil and evil good today? And we're comfortable with it. The most perverse thing, the most outrageous thing, we love to flaunt. And we think it's fine. And they're trusting in these empty words, but they're not going to save them. And they had no fear of God, and that's really the reality today. They did what they pleased. Isaiah continued on in verses 9 and 10 of Isaiah 59. Therefore, justice is far from us, nor does righteousness overtake us. We look for light, but there is darkness, for brightness, but we walk in blackness. We grope for the wall like the blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as at twilight. We are as dead men in desolate places. You know, yeah, it's fun for a time, but look at what happened in Minnesota with all that violence a few years back, right? They let it just run rampant, the burning of buildings and all. And then when it got so out of control, what do they do? Oh, we need help here. We need the government to bail us out because all the stuff, destruction, you didn't stop it. You see, it was fun for a time. But then there's, sometimes it gets too late. How do you stop something that is out of control? Well, the first step here is to receive the good tidings, to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and he brings peace to you, into your life. Not a peace in this world necessarily, not yet. And again, yes, when we think of peace, we think of an absence of trouble, life is going smoothly. How many of you are living a life that is just smooth, no problems at all? None of you? What is wrong with you people? Of course not. Why? We live in this world. It's a sin-filled world. There's problems. There's health issues, job issues, family issues, all kinds of things. But you know what? 
the creator of heaven and earth, when you make peace with him, he gives you a peace that can surpass all understanding. He gives you a peace in your heart where you can get a good night's rest. Paul said in Philippians, be anxious for nothing. But everything with prayer and thanksgiving, thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which guards your hearts and your minds, through Christ Jesus, right? Our hearts are our emotions. When we're fearful, when we lose hope, when we're anxious, when we're worried, aren't our emotions like out of control? God says, I can give you peace. What about our mind? Oh, Try and sleep at night when you're worried, right? Oh, what am I going to do? How am I going to handle this? What's... And your mind's running 240. You can't even sleep. And God says, I want to give you a peace of mind. I'm going to be with you always. I'll never leave you or forsake you. And I will see you through these difficult times. Does the shepherd lead the sheep through the valley of the shadow of death? Absolutely he does. There are dangerous places. But where is he taking them to? A mountaintop where there's times of refreshment. And God does that in our lives. We go through times that are very difficult. I remember there's several times in my life, you know, things were like in the church. Everything's running smoothly. I'm like, oh, this is so awesome. Everything is just, it's like a well-oiled machine. And then, like, instantaneously, it seems, it wasn't, but it seems, things are like out of control. What's going on? Oh, I'm going through the valley of the shadow of death. Why? Because I need to keep my eyes on the shepherd. All the stuff that's going on around me, I don't have that control. But he does, and I need to follow him through these times. And the same is true in your life. That peace of mind, those pe- that peace of emotions is found in Jesus. But here's the wonderful news. You know, yes, we make peace with Jesus, and we've got peace now with God, Peace in our lives. But one day, you know what? There's going to be peace on earth. We don't see that today. In fact, we see it look really bad out there. But there's coming a time where there's going to be peace on earth. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But the outward peace will not come unless you make peace with Jesus. You surrender to his will. And there is coming a day when there's going to be peace on earth. Look at verse 13 here in Luke chapter 2. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So here's this angel. He brings forth this good news to these shepherds. It's like heaven couldn't hold back anymore. You know, I, I could see them just trying to, oh, got to hold on a little, a little longer. And all of a sudden, they just break forth, right? And I know it says in your Bibles, glory to God in the highest and on earth, goodwill toward men. That's really not correct. What it should say is glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace towards men of goodwill. Or glory to God in the highest and peace among men with whom he is pleased. The peace of God, I'm sorry to say, is not for everyone. It's for those who have come into a relationship with Jesus. Who's God pleased with? Those who believe in him. And it's just not an acknowledgement of who he is. The demons know that who God is. They're not saved. It's giving your life to him. In fact, Jesus said in John 6, 29, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. There it is. That's the work that God has for us, that you believe. It all starts with belief. And it's not given, this God's peace, to those who have goodwill, nor to all, but those who are recipients of God's goodwill, his favor. In fact, Isaiah 48, 22 says, There's no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked, for the unsaved. They're not going to find the peace they're looking for. I'm not saying they don't try to find it or they try to accomplish it in their lives. It's just not going to be there because in this world, we don't have that kind of peace yet. But we can have peace with God, and that peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and minds when we come into relationship with him. And I love what Jesus said in John 16, 33. 
These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Where is our peace found? In Jesus. We need to keep reminding ourselves of that. Because if you're anything like me, things are going okay and things are not going okay, and then your mind is already focused on all these other things, and Jesus says you need to focus back on me, because that's the only place you're going to find peace. But there is coming a, a peace that will fill this land. And I'll just share with what it'll be like during the kingdom age when Jesus rules and reigns from Jerusalem. Isaiah 2, verses 1 through 4. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, now shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exhorted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Can you imagine that? We long for the day. But until then, our peace is found in Jesus. I know man keeps trying to work things out to play nice with each other, but because of man's heart, it doesn't work. The heart is wicked. And, you know, one writer said, men yearn for peace, but they will not acknowledge the hopelessness of their efforts to achieve it. It's only when the word of the Lord goes forth from Jerusalem, when he himself is reigning over the nations, that lasting peace will come. Absolutely. And it's not just peace among men, it's peace worldwide, even with the animal kingdom. Again, Isaiah 11, verses 6 through 9. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. And the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is the reign of the king, of Jesus. And no longer are there predators among the animals. They'll probably be herbivores once more, like they were when they were created, even man. You know, leopards don't lie down with a calf unless they're eating it, right? But in the kingdom age, they're all going to get along. And God gave man all the herb of the fields, all the green, every tree whose fruit yields seed for food when he created man. Even to the beast, he says, I gave that to them. But sin entered the world. And sometime after that, or right after the flood, I think it was sometime after sin entered the world, animals degenerated into carnivorous animals, meat eaters. And then after the flood, Genesis 9, God says, man can eat meat. It's not just the green herbs anymore. And all of creation is waiting for this day when God comes back. I find that interesting. We long for the day. And here's the thing. Man is reconciled to God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the Messiah on the cross at Calvary. And here in the kingdom age, peace is going to fill the land. Can you imagine a thousand-year reign of Christ? And if there's any trouble, Jesus deals with it immediately. I mean, it's not like he's going to, uh, you know, you got a court system. Hey, you did this. He's going to deal with it. But no more wars, no more fighting, no more evil. It's, I mean, I don't know what the news shows are going to do. 
because that's all they feed on, right? But peace on earth. But here's the thing. Did Jesus promise us peace or did he offer us peace? They may be thinking I'm splitting hairs here. I'm not. What did he say? Well, John 16, 33, These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. In me you may have peace. What does that mean? It's a choice, right? I'm going to either follow what Jesus is saying. I'm going to trust him as my good shepherd, even though I'm going through this valley of the shadow of death and I don't like it. I'm going to trust him because he's the good shepherd. And I can enjoy peace in the midst of the difficult times I'm going through. You know, that's what I need to hear. I don't know if that's what you need to hear, but that's what I need to hear. Because when I'm going through difficult times, it's easy to get distracted, as I've said. Again, not a promise of peace, but you can receive it if you want it. It's up to you. What the world has for you, I guarantee you, their peace is empty. But the peace that Jesus gives us surpasses all understanding. John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Wow. Do you believe that? Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't be afraid. Do we believe that no matter what comes our way? What does 2023 have for us? I have no clue. I have no clue. But I know who does. The Lord does. So can I trust in him that no matter what the world may throw at us or at me, that I can have peace through these times and be used to bring glory and honor to him and to share the good tidings of Jesus with the people of this world. You see, here's the thing. The most important birth in all of history is when God became flesh and dwelt among us. The Savior's born, right? It's as simple as that. That is the most important birth in history. My children are next. Well, maybe my grandchildren and then my children. I don't know. But this is exactly what mankind needed, a Savior to save them from their sins. They couldn't do this on their own. But God paid in full the penalty for our sins. I mean, if I'm already guilty, if I'm already a sinner, how can I make myself less a sinner? I can't. And I need a Savior, someone to save me, and that's Jesus. And yes, you know, when the angel stood before the shepherds who were out in the fields, the shepherds fear. They feared what was going on. But God doesn't want us to be fearful. So the angel brings what? Good tidings. The gospel message. And as we said, the separation of man from God because of sin has been reconciled through Jesus Christ. And we can enjoy the peace, that fellowship with God through Jesus. And then we talked about what was coming next. Peace on earth when he returns to set up his kingdom. And I don't know where any of you are at this morning. Maybe you're depressed. Maybe you're discouraged, in despair. Maybe you're wondering, you know, how you can know peace or happiness when you've got some difficult things going on in your life. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the song by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. It was written on Christmas Day back in 1863. And you may not know a lot about this man, but during this year, he was in a deep depression. What happened? What happened to bring this Christian into this depression? Well, the Civil War was raging on. His son ran away to join the Union Army. Uh, the bat not only that, but a in a battle, his son was severely wounded. His wife, Frances, died in a fire three years earlier. And it's Christmas time. And so this is weighing heavy upon his heart. So he tried to pull himself out of this depression. He began to write, and these are the words he wrote. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play. And wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. 
So as he's reflecting on all this, all that he's going through, the war, the death toll, all that's happened to his family, this is what he continued to write. And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong and mocks the son of peace on earth. Goodwill to men. That's not a very hopeful song, right? Not very encouraging, not very promising. But Longfellow didn't end it there. If he did, that would be very discouraging. But he focused on God and his word, and he ended it with these words. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doeth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. Those words helped to bring him out of that depression. He understood that God was in control. He's still on the throne, and no matter what's going on, no matter what he was going through, God was with him because he's, God's not dead. God was working. And I guess this morning I'll challenge you that no matter what, where you're at this morning, no matter what you're going through, God is not dead. I would encourage you to get into his word and remember the precious promises that he has towards you. None of us are without difficulty in our lives. There is not a single person here that says, hey, I've never had a problem in my entire life. You're a liar. We all do. How do we handle it is the key. Do we bring it to the Prince of Peace or do we try to deal it with ourselves? If we try to handle it on our own, it's not going to be too helpful. When we bring it to God, we can rest in his word and his promises to us and have that peace that surpasses all understanding. And I'll leave you with this promise from God in Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward and even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Keep in mind, we use this for at Christmas time, the birth of Christ, right? For unto us a child is born. But it's looking also into the future when Jesus is going to rule and reign, when the government will be upon his shoulder. We can have peace with God right now through Jesus Christ and we can have a peace that surpasses all understanding, looking for a time when Jesus Christ will rule and reign from Jerusalem and peace will fill this land. Never negate his promises and look to the good shepherd to lead you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the sacrifice of your son Jesus, that God became flesh and dwelt among us for the sole purpose of going to the cross at Calvary and paying in full the penalty for our sins. And I pray for everyone here this morning, those listening on the radio, the internet, that no matter what they're going through, Lord, that they would look to you to receive your peace and your comfort during the times, the struggles that they are having or maybe will have down the road. You know, Lord. And we just pray, help us to keep our eyes on the Good Shepherd because he's the one that leads us not only through the valley of the shadow of death, those difficult times, but up to the mountaintop where we can rest and find refreshment and encouragement before we go back down into the valley of the shadow of death to learn some more. Thank you, Lord, for being our God. And we just praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.